Welcome to the Funny Cause It's True podcast. I'm your host, Kevin McGeehan. Funny Cause It's True is recorded live every other Tuesday at the Second City Hollywood in Los Angeles, California. Storytellers are either predetermined or chosen randomly on the night of the show to tell a true story based on different themes. And this podcast is a mixed bag of some of my favorites. The theme of this episode is backfire. Three stories of things not quite going according to plan. Josh Willis discusses how climate change played a direct role in messing up his Valentine's Day. Kyle McGrath discovers how romantic scenes from Jerry Maguire don't necessarily translate into real life. And in part two of my story from last week, I recount the last seven days of my roommate's girlfriend's ill-fated two-week visit. But let's not dawdle. First up, an actual climate scientist from NASA, Josh Willis. Shit. That's actually what I said to my wife um, on Valentine's Day, uh, 2007. We were just about to get ready to go out on a hot date. Shit. I think ocean cooling might be wrong. I looked up from my computer just in time to see Dixie spin around on her stiletto heel, and she said, well, you're not going to lose your job over this, right? She put her hand on my arm like she was trying to comfort one of her dying patients, and I almost puked on it. So let me back up. I had just spent the previous 18 months convincing top climate scientists all around the world that even though people were still burning fossil fuels and even though the atmosphere was still warming, the oceans had actually cooled down between 2004 and 2006. Now, they actually had good reason to believe me. I, I have a PhD in this stuff. I am actually a world expert in this kind of data. And I'm also reasonably good looking. <laughs> but it was, kind of a, it was kind of a mystery though, right? I mean, you know, global warming, ocean cooling, how's that, how's that all gonna work out? So the climate scientists were kind of freaking out. By the way, you know, you know what a climate scientist looks like when they freak out? They look exactly the same as they always do, but one eyebrow goes up like Spock. <laughs> so if, like, if you ever come across a room full of climate scientists going like this, just build an arc, because you're <laughs> fucked. You're totally fucked. So uh, if the climate scientists were freaking out, I mean, the climate deniers and like the blogosphere, they, you know, when they heard about ocean cooling, they went ape shit. Global warming is a lie, and climate scientists are just a bunch of scam artists. I mean, I don't know about you, but whenever I read stupid stuff on the internet, I always imagine it in a southern accent. Maybe that's just where I'm from. But um, it really reached a fever pitch, though, when uh, Rush Limbaugh said in a nationwide broadcast that our results proved that climate scientists have no idea what's going on. He said... To overturn the world economy based on the musings of a few idiot leftist scientists is just stupid. And that's what global warming is actually all about. <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> so, anyway, through all of this, I, I held my guns. Ocean cooling was real. It was really there. It was in the data. And, you know, like it didn't matter how you twisted it or pulled it or pushed it. There it was. You know, ocean cooling. It was there. And then Valentine's Day, 2007, right there in our crappy little one bedroom with Dixie shooing me out the door trying to make it to our dinner reservation on time. That's when I found that there was a problem. There were a small group of instruments that were reporting impossibly cold temperatures. They were malfunctioning. And the entire climate science community had missed this. It was like our own wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> and, uh, you know, actually, it was crazy because once you tossed out the bad readings and you fixed a couple other problems, ocean cooling was gone. I raised one eyebrow. <laughs> so, so what happened? Well, unfortunately, Valentine's Day could not be saved. Not even a truckload of Viagra was going to make a happy ending on that one. <laughs> But, uh, uh, but I, I immediately published a correction to ocean cooling. You know, I highlighted my own mistakes. I said, you know, ocean cooling is wrong because that's actually how science works. That's why it works. You know, whenever we 
do something wrong, we let everybody know. We're like detectives. We're always trying to, to seek out the truth. And, uh, you know, I mean, Rush Limbaugh didn't talk about it on the radio, and uh, 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 the, the blogosphere didn't exactly blow up about ocean corrections. But, but there was one person, you know, uh, Dixie, that was really another matter. Fellas, if you ruin Valentine's Day, your, your wife is not going to let you forget it. So uh, a couple weeks later, she actually uh, bought me a brand new box of business cards uh, with the, the, uh, the, the job title reads, Idiot Leftist Scientist. Next up, Kyle McGrath. I moved to Los Angeles uh, right after Thanksgiving in 2008 uh, from Kansas. And uh, back in Kansas, I left a girlfriend. Uh, so this is going to end like all long-distance relationships end. Um, so six months go by. I'm out here. Uh, I, I started doing classes at Second City. I was working. I was busy all the time. Wasn't looking to go home anytime soon. Uh, but she kept coming out to visit. You know, she'd come out for like a couple days or whatever leave and then call me and say, hey, you know, I have, uh, um, I have a wedding. It's my cousin's wedding. Will you come out for that? And I was like, ah, it's your cousin's wedding. You know, it's not like it's your sister's wedding. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, and then, uh, so she comes back out. Then, um, she's like, hey, I'm graduating from cosmetology school. Would you come out? I was like, ah, it's not like you're graduating from Yale, you know, <laughs> like, let's, let's, uh, I, I found out that was like she was graduating from Yale. Uh, because, uh, the time is, uh, July 3rd, and I get this long text message that, a text message that comes from what I know is her Blackberry, because I fucking hated that Blackberry. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, a sidekick, uh, that said, you know, I don't think this is working out, um, this is it, and I sent one back saying, Chase, you're gonna... You're going to do this over a, a text message. I'm sorry, I'm out in L.A. This is it. The first thing that clicks in my mind is, I'm out in L.A., man. There are women all over this place, you know? So uh, for a week, I think that I'm awesome, and then it turns out that I'm not because I see a picture on Facebook of her and this guy, right? And the first thing that pops in my mind is, who is this guy and why do I need to kick his ass, right? <laughs> then the reality hits of, oh, it is over. So... I start stirring around because I'm all by myself. My, my roommate wasn't, uh, he was at work, and I start just having that gut feeling you have of, oh, my God, like, she's with this guy. Why isn't she calling me right now? I can't believe she's not calling me. She's probably with him right now. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? So I booked a ticket uh, because I am a huge fan of Jerry Maguire, and I'm like, I am going to pull a Jerry Maguire, right? My roommate comes home like, hey, Dan, I need for you to give me a ride to the airport at 2 in the morning. And he says to me, you are an idiot. You should not be doing this. Like, I like Chase, but no, man. Like, you got to you gotta pump the brakes in this. I was like, all right, you won't do it? Uh, then I'll, I'll call my friend Yo-Yo. Yo-Yo, you got to come get me. She's like, all right, I'm going to do it. But you're an idiot. You shouldn't be doing this, all right? So then I call my friend Kent in Kansas. I'm like, hey, buddy, you got you to gotta pick me up. Same response, man, we like Chase, but you, you gotta, you gotta stick back, right? So, get to Kansas, Ken picks me up, we're driving over to her, her house, the whole time he's giving me the speech of like, no, you can't, it, like, just, just prepare yourself, whatever. Knock on the door, she lives with her parents. Uh, her dad, Pat, who's a good old Kansas boy, answers the door with his Bud Light in his hand, and he, and he just goes, ha <laughs> ha, Kyle. <laughs> And her mom's right behind her and just right behind him and just breaks down in tears. She's like, oh, my God, you're here. Blah, 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 blah. Chase is downstairs, right? So I go downstairs and I see her and I, I, this is like, this is it. This is a Jerry Maguire moment, right? And I go, uh, I, I love you. I just had to say that in person. I just wanted you to know this. Blah, blah, blah. She, she breaks down in tears. Everything's great. She's like, let's go get some dinner. I'm like, Sweet. Then that fucking sidekick came in, right? So she starts clicking on her sidekick, texting all these people, and I was like, oh, what, what are you doing? She's like, well, I've been working out a lot lately. I was like, oh, that's great. Um, who you been working out with? And she's like, oh, my personal trainer. And I don't remember his name. I want to say it's probably Chad, right? <laughs> uh, no offense to any Chads out there, but 
Um, Chad is also sleeping with uh, Chase at this point in time. And Chad also owns a motorcycle. Of course, Chad owns a fucking motorcycle, right? <laughs> so my heart just drops. She decides that, uh, like, I, I, was, uh, I said, I, I can't do this. So I went back to my hometown. I had my dad come get me. Uh, I went back to my hometown. I was like, I'll just spend time with my family. And I'll leave in, like, three or four days. Uh, start to fly or drive back up to Kansas City. And Chase calls me, and she says, hey, it's my birthday on Friday. I was like, N yeah, I know, right? Uh, she goes, you know, you missed all these other things. It would be great if you just be here for my birthday. I said, okay, I'll stay. I'll stay. It was great. So we go out to lunch together on her birthday, and she's like, well, we can make this work. You know, I'm sorry. I'm just very frustrated with everything with you. And I was like, ah, understandable. All right, so let's, let's do this. She's like, well, let's hang out later on tonight. So then I'm at my friend Spencer's house doing the same thing, looking at my phone, going, when is she going to call? Oh, my God, what's going on? And then the phone rings, and it's her mom. And her mom says, Kyle, what are you doing tonight? And I was like, well, I thought I was hanging out with your daughter. <laughs> I, uh, why? And she's like, well, her and Chad um, are going to a concert. <laughs> Would you like to join Pat and I and Chase's sister and her, uh, two of her sisters, her brother-in-law and whatnot, for drinks? So her entire family takes me out to the to the saddle the, the saddle ranch, and we sit and we have drinks and and, and they're crying. They're like, we you know we wanted you in the family, blah blah blah. <laughs> this is when I get to send the best text message I've ever sent in my entire life. Chase texts me and says, "What are you doing right now?" I said, "I am having drinks on your birthday with your immediate family." How's your night going? <laughs> she didn't talk to me for like eight months, right? And finally, me, Kevin McGeehan, part two. I was very trepidatious about having a 16-year-old female living in the house, mostly because I was concerned that one of two things would happen. One, she would get an older man crush on me which was unacceptable, <laughs> or she would find me old and gross, which was also unacceptable. <laughs> All right, so to recap what had just happened, uh, I had just left the British office uncomfortableness of saying nice to meet you. They were going to be gone that night on day six. Uh, I get home or I spend the entire day happy. My house was going to be back. I was no longer going to be in the uncomfortable situation that, that, oh, that was my household for a while, and I was just gleeful. And then I put my key in the lock, and I walked in the door, and everyone was sitting there as if nothing had happened that morning. <laughs> I was greeted by Kitty. Mike and the 16-year-old daughter are sitting on his bed, and they're swapping stories about when they used to mess with teachers, and he was talking about how he put a slide in one of the slide projectors that was a, one of an erect penis, and, there's, there you go. and I was just sitting there steaming because I had not been told what was going on this entire day. I thought they would be gone, but I come home to find that this little family had set up nesting time there, not a phrase. So I walk over to Mike and I say, hey, how you doing? He goes, hey, how you doing? As if nothing had happened. I said, can we talk on the porch? I take him out on the porch and I say, what happened? I thought they were supposed to be gone. Oh, no, just uh, some things happened. Um, uh, and, uh, hemming and hawing until he eventually admitted that the price of a day of ticket for both of them across the country was so expensive that neither of them wanted to foot the bill that they just decided, eh, She'll stay here. <laughs> so they were now going to stay there. And all I said to him was, a text message would have been nice to know what I was walking into tonight. And then, we, uh, then I was very stern. When I get angry, I get stern. Uh, and I said to him, matter-of-factly, I am not saying that they have to leave. I am saying that I need to know what is going on. That's all I want. We shook hands and we parted ways. I went over to a friend's house. I didn't show up back into the house till 4 a.m. until everyone was asleep. 
A Hail Mary plan hatched by Mike backfired in his face because I woke up to a Facebook message that was essentially saying, Mike just told us that we have to leave because you refuse to have us in the house anymore. I thought you liked us. We were so, we like you so much. Why are you doing this? I'm so sorry. What did we do to make you be so vehement in saying, get us out of here now? So on day seven, I wake up to that letter and I immediately go from stern to sterner. And I burst out of my room and I go right to Mike's room and I start pounding on the door. I, I wake him up and, oh, hey, man, what's going on? Where is everyone? I want them here now. Uh, I think they're out taking a walk. Call them. Get them back here right now. What's, what's going on? I just got a letter. I don't want to hear it. Get them back here now. About five minutes later, after we are very uncomfortable in the house, Kitty and her 16-year-old daughter show back up at the house, and they're both very nervous. And I sternly say to Kitty, let's go talk on the porch. And I go and I take her out there and I tell her exactly where I'm coming from. I did not say that you have to leave. All I said was that you need to tell me what's going on. You guys have broken up and the tension in the house is so thick that I need to know what's going on. Please, I'm an unwitting accomplice in this whole thing. We both made our cases. I heard the she said of the he said, she said. And uh, she called me on something, which was this. The first time she came to visit... As I said, she had the rock and bod of Pan Anderson, and she didn't like to wear clothes, and didn't like to wear clothes around my house. So the first time I met her in that first visit, she was wearing a very small sports bra where it looked like her breasts were looking for any means of escape. <laughs> Short shorts and tall black boots that went past her knees. And all I kept thinking was, you wore that on the plane? So then I had said to Mike, if she comes back, please tell her to wear more clothes only because she's very shy and agoraphobic and will not make eye contact when she talks. So between not having eye contact and huge exposed breasts at me, I had nowhere to look and it was so uncomfortable. So she called me out on that and, and she said, uh, Mike told me that I, I made you uncomfortable last time. And I said, uh, yes. Uh, and thank you for wearing more clothes this time because I'm sh as I'm sure you are fully aware, your breasts draw the eye. And she laughed and thought that was very funny, and we hugged and we left on good terms. Then I walked back in the house, once again stern, and I pulled the 16-year-old daughter outside to the back porch, and I talked to her and said, please don't take this personally. Please don't be upset with this. I just need to know what's going on. I just want to make sure I like you. I think you're a great gal, very nice. Then I went back inside and I had my talk with Mike and then I left. Once again, reverting back to my behavior of just disappearing. And I left and I went and saw Prince of Persia, <laughs> which sucked as much as I anticipated it sucking. <laughs> but it got me out of the house two and a half more hours than I wanted to be there. So then everything I'll cut to the end. Everything works out fine. They end up leaving uh, at the end of day 14, and everything works out all right. Now, when I talked to the 16-year-old, there was one little thing that happened that really stood out to me, and it was this. That afternoon, as I came out of my bedroom, I, after just taking a nap, I walk past her bedroom, and I hear her say, Kevin, how was your nap? Being polite, I stuck my head back in the room to say, oh, it was fine. And she was standing there in nothing but a towel making eye contact with me. And I said, uh, I'm just going to go take a shower. And she says, oh, I just took one. And I said, okay, great. That's awesome. And I walked into the bathroom and I closed the door. And all I thought to myself was, well, thank God she didn't see me as old and gross. That's it. That's our show. Special thanks to our storytellers Josh Willis and Kyle McGrath. Also thanks to Josh Callahan, Mark Warzeka, The Second City Hollywood, and the Comedy Podcast Network for producing the show. 
If you would ever like to see the live show, Funny Because It's True is every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood, located on beautiful and mildly scary Hollywood Boulevard. You can also like Funny Because It's True on Facebook to find out upcoming show dates and themes. If you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, feel free to give us a good rating and write a nice comment on iTunes. It would be greatly appreciated and, quite honestly, would help us out a ton. The next live show is Tuesday, March 27th, and the theme will be A Friend in Need. Mark Rozeka is being a friend indeed that night because he is taking over the hosting duties since I will be across town at the Echoplex competing in the Moth Grand Slam competition. So come out to the show, put your name in contention, and maybe you'll get chosen to tell a true story on stage, and from there, get chosen to be on the podcast. My name is Kevin McGeehan. Thanks for listening. For more funny stuff for your eyes and ears, go to ComedyPodcastNetwork.com.